we go. All right, if you remember when we finished up last time, we were, were basically on Jude 11. We are in the book of Jude, and we are working through Jude 11. Jude 11 is the central verse, the chiastic center of Jude. If you remember, we talked about that Jude is a chiasm, and this is the chiastic center of Jude. It's the key focus of the book of Jude because it moves all the way to the middle, and then it um, actually goes backwards. Um, it, it repeats itself backwards. So Jude 11 says, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and, they pay, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam and perished in the destruction of Korah. Now that's Jude 11, the verse, which is oftentimes called the Woe Oracle because woe there, it says, it says woe to them. Woe is the Greek word, uawi, uh, which is, which means it conveys a warning of impending disaster or judgment. And last time we talked about this, we talked about how the apostates had gone the way of Cain and how they had rushed headlong into the error of Balaam. I'm not gonna go over those again, but that's where we were. And now today we're gonna look at the third lesson from history that Jude uses as he tells us that, that these apostates are rushing or they're perishing actually in the rebellion of Korah, okay? Now Korah, Korah was a Levite, which would make him a near relative of Moses and Aaron, wouldn't it? Because they were Levites as well, right? So we find the story of Korah in um, number 16, if you want to turn in your Bibles to number 16, although Julia's going to be reading, well, a bunch of you are going to be reading it for us. You know, Korah was one of the chief men of Israel. He had become jealous of Moses and Aaron. So he rose up in rebellion against them and against their spiritual rule over Israel. So let's, let's read, number, start in Numbers 16, verses 1 through 3. Now Korah, the son of Ishar, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took action. And they rose up before Moses together with some of the sons of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation chosen in the assembly of men renowned. And they assembled together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you have gone far enough, for all of the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourself above the assembly of the Lord? All right, so here we see Korah, Datham, Abram, and On, and they're rising up against Moses and Aaron. And together with 250 leaders of the congregation um, of Israel, these were men who were well known. Okay? This isn't just, he's not grabbing just everybody. He's grabbing well-known people. And in Hebrew tradition, Korah was a wealthy man. He was considered to have had great wealth. And, and here it's like he's trying to usurp Moses' positions. Because what's he telling them? He says, you've gone far enough. He says, for all the congregation is holy. Is all the congregation holy? Yeah. No. I think he's, and he doesn't get that, but... He says, for all the congregation is holy. He says, every one of them. He says, and, and he says, um, and, the, and God is in their midst. And that's true. God is in their midst. Okay. So he says, so why do you exalt yourself above the assembly? I mean, what makes you the boss? What makes you in charge? We don't think you should be in charge. I think, I think he's trying to usurp Mo Moses' position and start, who knows, maybe even a new priesthood. I don't know. Well, Moses responds to their challenges in the next two verses. Read verse four and five. When Moses heard this, he fell on his face. He spoke to Korah and all of the company saying, tomorrow morning, the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will bring him near to himself. Even the one whom he will choose, he will bring near to himself. Okay, so Moses responds to the challenge. He falls on his face. What does that mean when you fall on your face? Humility. Yeah, he's he's saying he's saying he's basically saying okay. Um, he, he first he's trying to get direction from God, right? I think the main thing he's trying to get direction from God, but he's he's being humble before them, and uh, because and because these men are challenging Moses, 
But Moses is, is making it very clear here, I think, to Korah and to these men involved with him that they're, that they're not really challenging him. They're not really challenging Moses and Aaron. They're challenging God. Okay, so let's go. Let, we're going to go down to verse 8. Let's read verses 8 through 11. Then Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi. It is not enough for you that the God of Israel has separated you for the from the rest of the congregation to bring you near to himself, to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to minister to them, and that he brought you near, Korah and all of your brothers, sons of Levi, with you. And are you seeking for the priesthood also? Therefore you and all of your company are gathered together against the Lord. But as for Aaron... Who is he that you should grumble against him? Now, Moses is saying, okay, all right, Korah, you know, the God of Israel has separated you apart to, to minister to the congregation of Israel. He's saying he's already done that. Okay, so you have already been set apart by God to, and to stand before the congregation and to minister to them. But um, he said, are you seeking a new priesthood? I mean... Is it really smart to go up against God? See, that's what he's saying. He said, you're, you're not going up against me. You're going up against God. Why are you doing it? Why, why? Why? He said, you and all your company are gathered against God, is what he's saying there. All right, so let's read a little bit more. Let's read. The, uh, let's go to um, verses 28 through 30. Steve, yeah. they were in charge of all the singing and all the worship and everything in the tabernacle. So they had a really important right. They, they did have a very important job. A lot I'm, of the songs in her yeah, and I'm sorry, verses 19 through 21. Who's got that? Oh, Number 16, 19 through 21. Uh, thus Korah assembled all the congregation against them at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and said, Separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them instantly. Okay, so 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 um, what, what's happening here? What, what's God telling him? He yeah, he's upset. <laughs> God tells Moses to tell the people to get away from the tent of Korah, Dathan, Doth, or Dathan and Abram. He says, "Get away from their tents." And I, we didn't. We, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but yeah, Moses just does just that. He says, "Get away, get away from here." Okay. Okay, so let's jump down after that to uh, verse 28 through 30. And Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these deeds, for this is not my doing. If these men die the death of all men, or if they suffer the fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord brings out an entirely new thing, and the ground opens up its mouth and swallows them up with all that is theirs, and, their, <coughs> and, and they descend to... Uh, alive in the show, then you will be. You will understand that these men have spurned the Lord. Wow. Okay, so Moses knows that God has called him. Right? We know that God called him to come to it, and he's now being challenged. So he basically got. I'm sure Moses has talked to the Lord, but he said, "By by this you know that Yahweh has sent me to do all these things, not by my doing." First off, if these men die. A regular death, a normal death. He says, he says, the fate of all men. If these men die just like everybody else, then I'm not your guy. God obviously didn't send me. But he's very specific. If the ground opens up and swallows these people alive, then you're going to know that I'm God's man here. I mean, that's pretty specific, isn't it? All right, let's read the next uh, three, uh, three verses, 31 through, or the next four verses, 31 through 33. Then it came about as he finished speaking. All these words that the ground was under them split open and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up and their households and possessions so that they all, so that all that belonged to them went down alive to show and the earth closed over them and they perished from the midst of the assembly. All right, so when did it happen? As soon as he quit speaking. As soon as Moses <laughs> finished speaking. All these words, it says, the ground that was under them split open and swallowed them. Can you imagine? Wow. I, mean, I mean, you know, we, we've read this before, but think about that. As soon as he finished speaking, the ground opened up and it swallowed Korah, 
his possessions, and his family. And the people who saw this, we're not going to read that, but the people who saw this all fled because they were afraid it was going to happen to them too. Mm -hmm. But you know what? That wouldn't work with God because he wasn't through. So now let's read verse 35. Who's got that? Numbers 16, 35. Fire also came forth from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering the incense. Yeah, I mean, God wasn't through. He, uh, he, 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 you know, he'd already killed Korah, and, and, but now he's going to kill the other 250. Okay. And how did he do it? Fire. With fire. Can you imagine fire coming out of, you know, heaven and, and just consuming all these people? 250 people died here. They were burned with fire. You know, Korah had these 250 leaders of Israel standing with him, and they're now dead. Okay? Think about that. Korah, Korah must have had some support. 250 people, that's a lot to going up against. I guess they didn't like the fact that they were having to eat um, manna all the time or that they had to follow this. Actually, I think Korah was more interested in the spiritual leadership is what it seems to me, that that's what he's looking at. But he had 250 men. Korah must have had a lot more popular support, though, because we're going to see this. It's going to become very evident when the people come back at Moses. Let's read verse 41, Billy. And on the next day, all the congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, saying, You are the ones who have caused the death of the Lord's people. Okay, are, are, these peop you know, are these people crazy? I mean, what did they just see? The ground opened up and took these people, just as Moses had told them, right? I mean, just as Moses had predicted, the ground opened up. I mean, and we're not the, the 250 followers burnt up by God. Moses didn't do it. Moses didn't f put the fire on them, but it was God. Okay, did they really want to challenge God again? I, I can't imagine. So God tells Moses, we're not going to read all this, but God tells Moses and Aaron to get away from the congregation so that he could destroy them. Okay? And this, he's talk, we're talking about Israel here. God's going to destroy Israel. Okay? But he tells Aaron and Moses how to make atonement for them. They have a censer. They have to go dip it in the fire at the altar and bring it back out to the people okay? to make atonement. It's not a lot. But to make atonement, and he says, do it quickly. So when, when, when all this is starting to happen, the plague has, a plague has begun, okay? And Moses, or Aaron takes this censer out. He gets it out to the people quickly. He rushed out with the incense. But by the time he got to the people to make atonement, 14,700 people had died from this plague. So almost 15,000 people died from the plague brought on by God because of the rebellion of Korah. And that's what Job is talking, or that's what uh, Joel, whatever, whatever, Jude, whatever book we're reading, yeah. Jude is talking about, yeah. Um, Korah spoke against Moses and led many people to their deaths. Through what? Through his false doctrine, right? He wanted to lead and tried to take the leadership from Moses, but Moses' leadership and authority came from God not from himself. And he, that was proven to Israel. So all these men, Cain, Balaam, and um, Korah, rebelled against God and his doctrine, didn't they? They wanted to do things their way. The, all of these people were apostates. They had, they had turned from God just like apostate Israel had, just like the apostate angels, and just like Sodom and Gomorrah had turned from God. Um, all those remind us of the judgment that God has for apostates and the ones who fall away from God and his truth. Okay, so that's the main focus of Jude. That's verse 11. But today we're going to go on to verses 12 and 13, hopefully. We'll be able to get through those. As we look ahead to verses 12 and 13, um, this is where Jude moves from telling us where Jude, where, 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 where Jude moves from telling us the history of the apostates that he has been dealing with since verse 4 to describing them. Okay? He moves from the natural world, he moves um, to the natural world and gives us five analogies that point directly to the apostates, okay? Here Jude is describing the errors of the apostates. He's telling us 
how they are threatening the purity of the church. So let's read, whoever's got Jude 12 and 13, would you read that for us? These are the men who are hidden beneath and will love thee, and they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by wind, autumn trees without fruit, definitely dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved for yeah, so, so Jude is telling us that these apostates are what? They're hidden reefs in your love feast. They're clouds without water. They're autumn trees without fruit. They're wild waves of the sea, casting their own shame like foam. And they're wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved. You know, again, Jude brings us back to the men that we, start, we saw in verse 4. These are the, the, it says, these are the men. And um, the, the, those men are the certain persons that have crept in unnoticed into the churches, okay? These are the same men that we see in verses 8, 10, and 11. Woe to them, he say. So let's look at how Jude describes these men. First, he says, these men are like hidden reefs in your love feasts. That sounds pretty strange, doesn't it? They are hidden reefs in your love feasts. Now, hidden reefs, that's the Greek word spillus. And spillus refers to a rock in the sea, a ledge, a reef that's hidden just below the surface that you can't see. Um, we actually, actually, spillers is a word that's used in the Odyssey. It's a, in the Odyssey, it says the waves dash the ship against the spillers. Okay, These rocks or reefs were hidden under the water that the captain of the ship couldn't see them. He would know where these things are normally, but a spiller you can't see. So once somebody hits them, you know you're not supposed to go that way. So um, they're hidden under the water just right where you can't see them until you hit them. Okay? And I, 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 I tell you a personal story. Um, about two years ago, I found a spiller on Lake Martin. Okay, we were going along very nicely, and all of a sudden we hit a spiller. And uh, it, bent the crank, it, bent, it bent the crankshaft of my motor and chipped a... Uh, um, my propeller. We did get home, but it cost me about nine hundred dollars to fix that because I didn't see that spiller. Okay, and that's exactly what it is. It's a hidden rock. It's a hidden reef below the surface. Just so you understand what that is. Um, well, this is an example that Jude is giving us. These men, these apostates, they're just like these reefs or rocks hidden under the surface, things you don't realize what's happening. They're dangerous for the ships. They're dangerous for Christians, okay, to allow in. The metaphor actually suggests two characteristics of these men. First, that they're concealed. You can't see them. You don't know that you don't know what's going on under the surface. And they present a danger, especially a spiritual danger, um, especially for the immature Christian, the young sheep. And these men are hidden reefs in what? In your love feasts. Okay. Anybody know what a love feast is? Yeah, I didn't either. So um, in your love feast, a love feast is a prepositional phrase in the Greek. Love feast is a translation of the Greek word agape. Now we know the Greek word agape, but the Greek word agape in the first and second centuries um, basically developed as a meaning that referred to meals that the early church held together, okay? an agape meal. That's a love feast, okay? A love feast is a common meal eaten by early Christians in connection with the church service, in connection with their church services for the purpose of fostering and expressing brotherly love. I was gonna say it's a covered dish. It's basically <laughs> it's basically a covered dish. Let me let me let me tell you what Will, William yeah. yeah William Barclay described the love feast. He said the love feast, the agape, was one of the earliest features of the church. It was a meal of fellowship held on the Lord's Day. To it, everyone brought what he could, and it, and all shared alike. It was a lovely idea that the Christians in each little house church could, should sit down at the, on the Lord's Day to eat in fellowship together. No doubt there were some who could bring much more and others who could bring very little for many of the slaves. It was perhaps the only decent meal they ever ate. But very soon the agape began to go wrong. 
Uh, we can see it going wrong in the church at Corinth when Paul declares that at the Corinthian love feast, there is nothing but division. So see, it's, it is something that, um, that is causing problems, and um, Paul actually brings it up. We're going to look at that in 1 Corinthians. Barclay says that these agape meals, these love feasts, was a great idea. Like you said, potluck, right? It, it's a great idea. Everyone shared what he could, but for some, it was the best meal they ever they could have. But something happened at these meals, and Paul was seeing it in the Corinthian church. Let's read 1 Corinthians 11, verses 17 and 18. Who's got that? But in giving this instruction, I did not praise you, because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together to church, I see that division is working on you, and in part, I believe it. Yeah, um... They come together for church and worship and ate the agape meal, but it ended up being anything but love, okay? Now, if you'll continue, read 20 and 22. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, but when you're eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this, I will not praise you. Yeah, the Corinthian church became divided. It became divided into cliques and factions, okay? Some ate much, some ate nothing. For others, it became a drunken party, okay? And that's not what we want to do at church, is it? We it don't want it to be a drunken party. Well, eventually, so many problems happened with these agape feasts. That at the Council of Carthage in 397, the love feasts, they, they, they forbid them at the Council of Carthage. So I'm guessing that the churches didn't change the way their ways in spite of Paul's warning, did they? Okay, well, let's go back to Jude. He says, these are the men who are hidden in the reefs at, in your love feasts. When they feast with you without caring for them, without fear, caring for themselves. And it went, the Greek word, when they feast with you, that's one Greek word, sonyo kimai. That's as good as I can do, okay? Sonyo kimai which means to feast together, to banquet with, to socialize with. These men are feasting together with you, putting forth these wrong ideas, these heresies. And he says, without fear of being detected. Okay? They're not afraid because they fit in. Okay? They're, they are caring for themselves. That's poimano, which means the New American Standard, I think, has a bad, tra poor translation here. Poimano actually means protecting, shepherding, or nurturing. Jude uses this word poimano, which may suggest to us that the, these apostates were masquerading as leaders, shepherds, or leaders. The love feasts were designed for people to take care of each other. And they would sit around talking, shepherding each other, but they and they learned from each other. But these men, these apostates, were only in it for themselves presenting their heresies without fear of detection. That's what, Jude, that's what Jude knew, and that's why he was trying to get it across to the church to watch out for these folks. Watch out for these spillers. Watch out for these people under the surface, these hidden reefs. Steve, I think there's something interesting in the difference in the interpretation. You know, they said these men are blemishes, which, you know, to me, a blemish is visible. Yeah. So is it that they're... Actually, like what we're seeing in society now, you see things that you know are wrong and they just fit right in like it's wrong. That's the whole thing, yeah. It's, it's something that fits right. That's that's what it was. They were fitting in, yeah. But under the surface, there's a problem, right? But and, I think it's by accident that Steve preached, that uh, Sean preached a sermon he preached this morning. About the tongue? On mm -hmm. the tongue. Yeah, that's true. And how easy it is to have grumblers in the church and that's people right. who un un backbite each other. And right underneath the surface. Yep. So things behind the back that yep. might not be said up front. And you know, Jude saw all this happening in the church, so he knew he had to write. Because if you remember, he was going to write about their common salvation. Remember, that's that's in the very first part of Jude. But he said, I could, I can't because I've got to write to you about these problems that I'm seeing in the church. And that's what that's what he's that's here. And this is what he's talking about. The next, next metaphor he gives us, he said, these men are like clouds without water.
carried by the winds. You know, the interpretation of this metaphor is pretty straightforward. Clouds without water. I mean, have you ever been, you've been out there in the field one time with your kids or whatever, your family, and you see this dark cloud coming at you, you say, well, we better get in, right? But it passes right by you. It's a cloud without water. Now the cloud has water, but it's not dropping in on you, is it? No rain, no help for the farmer, no help for your lawn. Well, these, these apostates actually are men that ha have an air of authority about them or offering hope to the church that they can bring the needed spiritual rain, but they actually bring nothing. And that's what Jude's saying. They've, they've got, they, they, they act like they've got something there, but they actually have nothing. These false teachers promise to bring you the blessing of God, to lead you in the path of God, but they don't deliver anything. So these apostates are a hidden danger. They offer false promises. And what we see next is that they're barren. What's the next thing he says? He says, they're auto, these men are like autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted. You know, at a time when they're, when, when they're expected to fruit and have none, why? Because they actually are dead. They're not alive. They're not alive. They're not alive in Christ. They're not alive in God. They are dead. They are like these trees. They're like these trees. They've grown, but they become disconnected from their life source of water and nutrients. And who is our life source? God, God. right? Christ. Our, our life source is God and Christ. And, but these people are not connected to the life-giving source of the, the nutrients and water. They're just like Jesus. They're just like what Jesus said the Pharisees were. Who's got Matthew 15, verse 13? But he answered and said, every plant which my fa heavenly father did not plant shall be uprooted. Yeah, every plant which my father did not plant shall be uprooted. Such people produce no life-changing fruit and never will. Okay? The next metaphor Jude gives us is wild waves of the sea casting their own shame like foam. You know, Jude here is speaking of the apostate's instability or judgment. He could be thinking of Isaiah 57. What does it say in Isaiah 57? But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up refuse and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Yeah, the wicked are like the tossing sea. There's no peace for the wicked. No peace. And no peace is judgment. The men that Jude is talking about here have no peace. They are fallen. They have fallen away from the truth. You know, basically they're doubters. What does James say about doubters? But let him ask in faith without any doubting. The one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Yeah, these people are doubters. They're, they're just like, they're tossed about by the, by the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. They're ju and just like the waves of the sea, they're casting their own shameful deeds upon the church like the foam of the sea. Okay? All right, then Jude, I think we have enough time. We do. Then Jude gives our final metaphor. Wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been received forever. You know, most commentators see this as referring to shooting stars. And, uh, you know, our world is a family is in a family of planets that revolve around the sun, right? They're on a fixed pattern revolving around the sun. All right, sometimes a wandering body, a wandering piece traveling through space enters our planet's atmosphere, doesn't it? And what happens when it enters our atmosphere? It burns, it burns up. And as it burns up, we get to see it, don't we? We get to see it momentarily. Sometimes we just see a little thing like this. Oh, I saw one. You sure? Yeah. Didn't you see that? Sometimes they go all the way across the sky. I mean, sometimes they're amazing what we can see. I think this is a, an excellent example of an apostate. An apostate is someone who's come under the, the influence of the son of righteousness and believes for a time but for whatever reason, falls away and burns out. The planets and the stars are all set in their course by God, right? Whereas a wandering star is not or subject to God's control or doesn't think they are or doesn't feel they are. And his, their destiny is then, of course, black darkness. The fate of a wandering star is typical of the fate of the man who disobeys God's commandments and chooses his own course. In contrast, true believers enjoy a lifelong love feast with God. Let's look at that. Instead of being a lifeless, dangerous, instead of being lifeless, dangerous rocks, 
Believers are living stones, and Jesus is the rock of our salvation. Rather than being waterless clouds, true believers are we're the sources of living water because our source is the true living water, and we can lead people to it. Far from being dead trees, true believers are called the trees of righteousness or the planting of the Lord, and Jesus is our tree of life. In contrast with the raging waves of the sea, a Christian's peace is like a river. Jesus leads us beside the still waters as we let him, right? Whereas wandering stars have reser are reserved for the unbeliever, eternal darkness, true believers, will shine as the stars in their place forever. The Spirit of God led Jude to actually describe all these characteristics of the apostates because this helped people, this helps us understand what apostates do and how they take us away from God because they've already taken themselves. They've already turned themselves away from God. He reinforced Peter's letter by adding his own information. Both Peter and Jude are warning the churches of these apostates creeping into the church with their destructive heresies. And folks, we too, we too must be careful not to allow ourselves to be drawn away and deny our master and Lord Jesus the, the Christ. How much Psalms 1 applies to all this? Doesn't it? Yeah. What, is, what does it say? We read about six verses. Is that okay? Go ahead. Sure. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in the season. His leaf does not wither, and in whatsoever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like shaft, which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Yeah, I wish I wish I'd thought to put that. So thanks. That's very helpful. I mean I mean all these things we have to understand. We too could fall away from God if we're not careful and fall into apostasy, which means turning our, our back on God. And we could do that. But um, as we stay in the word, as we stay, as we stay in prayer, as we stay in relationship with Christ, that's not gonna happen. Anybody else have anything? I wanted yeah. to say something about uh, those 250 men who offered incense. And if, if you haven't ever studied the tabernacle, you don't realize that right outside of the, cur the veil, the curtain, was the altar of incense. And it represented the prayers of the people. But God, when he told them how to build the tabernacle, which was supposed to be a picture of heaven, he set up a certain type of incense that had to be made exactly according to his prescription. If anybody else ever made that incense, they would die. You couldn't use it at all. So the priests were the only ones that could go in and offer the incense. And one of the kings, Uzziah, he was one of the few good kings of Judah. But And, you know, everything about him was wonderful. He was a great king. He brought the people back to the Lord. But he got haughty, and he decided that he wanted to go in with the incense to the altar and do the altar inside the holy place. And so, you know, all the priests were begging him, don't do that, don't do that. So he goes in with it, and he immediately becomes a leper, and he just had to go out of the whole, he was the king, and he had to move outside of the, the whole city and, you know, die a leper because he did that. So, just, you know, when you say offering incense, that, that was a huge deal. It, meant a lot it was a huge deal, but they Mom wanted the more. Could do it and they but they, these to do Korah it. wanted more, and these uh, he talked to these other people that they wanted more. I mean, who is Moses to be in charge of us all these years? You know, look, we're wandering in the wilderness. You know, I think we should take over. And when they tried to take over, the earth swallowed them up. And when the people complained, they got a plague. And in a matter of minutes, fourteen thousand seven hundred of them died. That's amazing. It kind of reminds me of a serpent. Yeah, it does. And he wanted to be like God. That's right. Absolutely. All right. Anything else? All right, let's pray.